Thank you very much. I'm Jeff Eugenides. Um, it's great to be here, back in Brooklyn where I used to live. It's wonderful to be here eating, drinking, and being literary. Um, I eat and drink a lot, but I, I'm often not literary while I'm, while I'm doing it. Uh, last time I was, I was here a week, a couple of weeks ago, just across the street at the opening of Matthew Barney's um, new movie, River of Fundament, six hour long um, movie, and um, I'm just going to read for five hours tonight. <laughs> it seems to be a, a kind of a bam, bam thing to do. Actually, I'm only going to read 15 minutes, as you heard, and then we'll talk. Um, I was just discussing this with Ben. I'm going to read from a short story, and he said, well, are you just going to read from it, or are you going to jump around and give plot summary to read the whole thing? And I said, no, no one really listens to the plot summary. So I'm just going to read at the beginning and leave you all extremely unsatisfied um, when, I, when I end in about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I didn't know this place would be so lousy with Greeks tonight. Um, you, tr you, tr you try to get out and they keep bringing you back in. Um, no, it's actually wonderful to be here. I've actually um, done an event at, at the Onassis Center and I'm happy, I'm happy to be here, though I always feel a little bit fraudulent, fraudulently Greek since I don't speak Greek. Um, I, speak, I speak German, there are some Greeks in Germany, but <laughs> I'm only half Greek. This story is not about a Greek at all, fortunately, for me tonight. Um, I have to do some accents as I read this, and I apologize to you. But if I didn't do it, you wouldn't know who's speaking. And if I don't do it well at all, you won't know who's speaking either, but I'll, I'll do my best. This story is called Find the Bad Guy. We've owned this house for what, 12 years now, I reckon? Bought it from an elderly couple, the De Rouge Monts, whose aroma you can still detect around the place, in the master especially, and in the home office where the old buzzard napped on summer days, and a little bit in the kitchen still. I remember going into people's houses as a kid and thinking, can't they smell how they smell? Some houses are worse than others. The Pruitts next door had a greasy chuck wagon odor, tolerable enough. The Willets, who ran that fencing academy in their rec room, smelled like skunk cabbage. You could never mention the smells to your friends because they were part of it too. Was it hygiene? Or was it, you know, glandular? And the way each family smelled had to do with bodily functions deep inside their bodies. The whole thing sort of turned your stomach the more you thought about it. Now I live in an old house that probably smells funny to outsiders, or used to live. At the present time, I'm in my front yard hiding out between the stucco wall and the traveler palms. There's a light burning up in Meg's room. She's my sugar pie. She's 13. From my vantage point, I can't make out Lucas's bedroom, but as a rule, Lucas prefers to do his homework downstairs in the great room. If I were to sidle up to the house, I'd more than likely spy Lucas in his school v-neck and necktie, armed for success. Graphing calculator, check. St. Boniface iPad, check. Latin Quizlet, check. Bowl of goldfish, check. But uh, I can't go up there now on account of it would uh, violate the restraining order. I'm not supposed to come any closer than 50 feet to my lovely wife, Johanna. It's an emergency TRO, meaning temporary, issued at night with a judge presiding. My lawyer, Mike's peak skills, in the process of having it revoked. In the meantime, guess what? Yours truly, Charlie D., still has the landscape architect's plans from when Johanna and I were thinking of replacing these palms with something less jungly and prone to pests. So I happen to know for certain that the distance from the house to the stucco wall is 63 feet. Right now, I reckon I'm about 60 or 61 here in the vegetation. And anyway, nobody can see me because it's February and already dark in these parts. It's Thursday, so uh, where's Bryce? Right. Trumpet lessons with Mr. Talawatomi. Your hand will be going to pick him up soon. Can't stay here long. If I were to leave my hideout and mosey around the side of the house, I'd see the guest room where I used to retreat when Johanna and I were fighting real bad, and where last spring, after Johanna got promoted at Hyundai, I commenced to putting the blocks to the babysitter, Cheyenne. 
And if I kept going all the way into the backyard, I'd come face to face with the glass door I shattered when I threw that long gnome through it. Drunk at the time, of course. Yes, sir. Plenty of ammunition for your hand to play find the bad guy at couples counseling. It's not cold, cold out, but it is for Houston. When I reach down to take my phone out of my boot, my hip twinges, touch of arthritis. I'm getting my phone to play words with friends. I started playing it over to the station just to pass the time, but then I found out Meg was playing it too, so I sent her a game invite. In Mrs. Bieber versus Radio Cowboy, I see that Mrs. Bieber has just played poop. She's trying to get my goat. Meg's got the first P on a double word space and the second on a double letter space for a total of 28 points. Not bad. Now I play an easy word, Paul, for a measly score of nine. I'm up 51 points, don't want her to get discouraged and quit on me. I can see her shadow moving around up there, but she doesn't play another word. Probably Skyping or blogging, painting her nails. Johanna and me, you, you say it, Johanna, by the way, she's particular about that. We've been married 21 years. When we met, I was living up in Dallas with my girlfriend at the time, Jenny Braggs. Back then, I was consulting for only three stations spread over the state, so I spent most of every week on the road. Then one day, I was up in San Antonio at WWWR, and there she was, Johanna, shelving CDs. She was a tall drink of water. How's the weather up there, I said. Pardon me? Nothing. Hi, I'm, I'm Charlie D. That an accent I hear? Yes, I'm German. Didn't know they liked country music in Germany. They don't. Maybe I should consult over there, spread the gospel. Who's your favorite country recording artist? I am more into opera, Johanna said. I get you. Just here for the job, huh? After that, every time I was down San Antonio Way, San Antonio Way I made a point of stopping by Johanna's desk. It was uh, less nerve-wracking if she was sitting. You ever play basketball, Johanna? No. Do they have girls basketball over there in Germany? In Germany, I am not that tall, Johanna said. <laughs> that was about how it went. Then one day I come up to her desk and she looks at me with those big blue eyes of hers and she says, Charlie, how good an actor are you? Actor or liar? Liar. Pretty decent, I said, but uh, I might be lying. <laughs> I need a green card, Johanna said. Roll the film, me emptying my waterbed into the bathtub so I can move out while Jenny Braggs weeps copious tears. Johanna and me cramming into a photo booth to take cute early relationship photos for our scrapbook. Be bringing that scrapbook to our immigration here in six months later. Now, uh, Ms. Lubbock, do I have that right? Lubeck, Johanna told the officer. There's an umlaut over the oo. Not in Texas, there ain't, the officer said. Now, Mrs. Lubbock, I'm sure you can understand that the United States has to make certain that those individuals who we admit to a path of citizenship by virtue of their marrying U.S. citizens are really and truly married to those citizens. And so I'm going to have to ask you some personal questions that might seem a little intrusive. Do you agree to my doing that? Johanna nodded. When was the first time you and Mr. D... He stopped short and looked at me. Hey, you aren't the Charlie Daniels, are you? Nuh-uh. That's why I just go by the D, to avoid confusion. Because you sort of look like him. I'm a big fan, I said. I take that as a compliment. He turned back to Johanna, smooth as butter. When was the first time you and Mr. D had intimate sexual relations? You won't tell my mother, will you? Johanna said, trying to joke. But he was all business. Before you were married or after? Before. And would you, how would you rate Mr. D's sexual performance? <laughs> what do you think? Wonderful. I married him, didn't I? Any distinguishing marks on his sex organ? It says in God we trust, like on all Americans. <laughs> the officer turned to me, grinning. You got yourself a real spitfire here, he said. Don't I know it, I said. Back then, though, we weren't sleeping together. 
That didn't happen until later. In order to pretend to be my fiancé and then my bride, Johanna had to spend time with me, getting to know me. She's from Bavaria, Johanna is. She had herself a theory that Bavaria is the Texas of Germany. People in Bavaria are more conservative than your normal European leftists. They're Catholic, if not exactly God-fearing. Plus, they like to wear leather jackets and such. <laughs> Johanna wanted to know everything about Texas, and I was just the man to teach her. I took her to South by Southwest, which wasn't the cattle call it is today. And oh, my Lord, if Johanna didn't look good in a pair of blue jeans and cowboy boots. Next thing I know, we're flying home to Michigan to meet my folks. I'm from Traverse City originally, got to talk in this way on account of living down here so long. My brother Ted gives me a hard time about it. I tell him, you got to talk to talk in the business I'm in. Maybe it was Michigan that did it. It was wintertime. I took Johanna snowmobiling and ice fishing. My mama would never have seen eye to eye on the whole green card thing, so I, I just told her we were friends. Once we got up there, though, I overheard Johanna telling my sister that we were dating. On perch night at the VFW Hall, after drinking a few PBRs, Johanna started holding my hand under the table. I didn't complain. I mean, there she was, all six foot plus of her, healthy as can be and with a good appetite, holding my hand in her, secret from everyone else. I'll tell you, I was happier than a two-peckered dog. <laughs> my mother put us in separate bedrooms. But one night, Johanna came into mine, quiet as an engine, and crawled into bed. This part of the method acting, I said. <laughs> no, Charlie, this is real. She had her arms around me, and we were rocking, real soft-like, the way Meg did after we gave her that kitten. Before it died, I mean, when it was just a warm and cuddly thing instead of like it had hoof and mouth and went south on us. Feels real, I said. Feels like the realest thing I ever did feel. Does this feel real too, Charlie? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and this? Let me see, I need to uh, reconnoiter. Oh, uh, oh yeah, that, uh, that's real real. Love at 15th sight, I guess you could call it. I look up at my house and cogitate some I don't want to rightly say what about. The thing is, I'm a successful man in the prime of life. Started DJing in college, and okay, my voice was fine for the 3 to 6 a.m. slot at Marquette, but out in the real world, there was an upper limit, I'll admit. Never did land me a job in front of a microphone, telemarketed instead. Then the radio itch got back into me, and I started consulting. This was in the 80s when you had your first country rock crossovers. A lot of stations were slow to catch on. I told them who and what to play, started out contracting for three stations, and now I've got 67 coming to me asking, Charlie D, how do we increase our market share? Give us your crossover wisdom, sage of the sagebrush. That's on my website. People have sort of picked it up. But what I'm thinking right now doesn't make me feel so sage-like. In fact, not even a hair. I'm thinking, how did this happen to me, to be out here in the bushes? Find the bad guy is a term we learned at couples counseling. Me and Johanna saw this lady therapist for about a year named Dr. Vanderjack, Dutch. Had a house over by the university with separate paths to the front and back doors. That way people leaving didn't run into those showing up. Say you're coming out of couples therapy and your next door neighbor's coming in. Hey, Charlie D, he says, how's it going? And you say, the missus has just been saying I'm verbally abusive, but I'm doing okay otherwise. <laughs> nah, you don't want that. Tell the truth, I wasn't crazy about our therapist being a woman plus European. I thought it would make her partial to Johanna's side of things. At our first session, Johanna and I chose opposite ends of the couch, keeping throw pillows between us. Dr. Vanderjack faced us, scarf big as a horse blanket. She asked what brought us. Talking, making nice, that's the female department. I waited for your Hannah to start in. But the same cat got her tongue as mine. Dr. Vanderjack tried again. Johanna, tell me how you were feeling in the marriage. Three words. Frustrated. Angry. Alone. 
Why? When we met, Charlie used to take me dancing. Once we had kids, that stopped. Now we both work full time, we don't see each other all day, but as soon as Charlie comes home, he goes out to his fire pit, you're always welcome to join me, I said, and drinks all night, every night. He is married more to the fire pit than to me. I was there to listen, to connect with Johanna, and I tried my best. But after a while, I stopped paying attention to her words and just listened to her voice, the foreign sound of it. It was like if Johanna and I were birds, her song wouldn't be the song I'd recognize. It would be the song of a species of bird from a different continent, some species that nested in cathedral belfries or windmills, which to my kind of bird would be like, well, la dee da For instance, regarding the fire pit. Didn't I try to corral everyone out there every night? Did I ever say I wanted to sit out there alone? No, sir. I'd like us to be together as a family under the stars with the mesquite flaming and popping. But Johanna, Bryce, Meg, and even Lucas, they never want to. Too busy on their computers or their Instagrams. How do you feel about what Johanna is saying? Dr. Vanderjack asked me. Well, I said, when we bought the house, Johanna was excited about the fire pit. I never liked the fire pit. You always think that because you like something, I like the same thing. When the real estate lady was showing us around, who was it said, hey, Charlie, look at this. You're going to love this. Yeah, and you wanted a wolf stove. You had to have a wolf stove, but have you ever cooked anything on it? Grilled those steaks out in the pit that time. Right around there, Dr. Vanderjack held up her soft little hand. We need to try to get beyond these squabbles. We need to find what's at the core of your unhappiness. These things are only on the surface. We went back the next week, and the week after that, Dr. Vanderjack had us fill out a questionnaire ranking our level of marital contentment. She gave us books to read, Hold Me Tight, which was about how couples tend to miscommunicate, and The Volcano Under the Bed, which was about overcoming and sexual dry spells and made for some pretty racy reading. I took off the covers of both books and put on new ones. That way people at the station, station thought I was reading Tom Clancy. <laughs> little by little, I, I picked up the lingo. F find the bad guy means how when you're arguing with your spouse, both people are trying to win the argument. Who didn't close the garage door? Who left the Bigfoot hair clump in the shower drain? What you have to realize as a couple is that there is no bad guy. You can't win an argument when you're married because if you win, your spouse loses and resents losing and then you lose too, pretty much. Due to the fact that I was a defective husband, I started spending a lot of time alone being introspective. What I did was I'd go to the gym and take a sauna. I'd drop her some eucalyptus into a bucket of water, toss the water on the fake rocks, let the steam build up, then turn over the miniature hourglass, and for however long it took to run out, I'd introspect. I like to imagine the heat burning all my excess cargo away. I, I could stand to lose a few like the next guy until all that was left was a pure residue of Charlie D. Most other guys hollered that they were cooked after 10 minutes and red-assed it out of there. Not me. I just turned the hourglass over and hunkered on down some more. Now the heat was burning away my real impurities, things I didn't even tell anyone about. Like the time after Bryce was born and had colic for six straight months, when in order to keep from throwing him out the window, what I did was drink a couple bourbons before dinner and when no one was looking, treat Forlock as my personal punching bag. He was just a puppy then, eight or nine months. He'd always done something. A grown man beating on my own dog, making him whimper, so your hand would call out, hey, what are you doing? And I'd shout out, he's just faking, he's a big faker. Or the times more recent when Johanna was flying to Chicago or Phoenix and I'd think, what if her plane goes down? Did other people feel these things or was it just me? Was I evil? Did Damien know he was evil in The Omen and Omen 2? <laughs> Did he think Ave Satana was just a catchy soundtrack? Hey, they're playing my song. 
My introspecting must have paid off because I started noticing patterns. As, as a for instance, your Hannah might come into my office to hand me the, cup of the cap of the toothpaste I had forgotten to screw back on. And later, that would cause me to say, Achtung, when your Hannah asked me to take out the recycling, which would get your Hannah madder than a wet hen. And before you know it, we're fighting World War III. In therapy, when Dr. Vanderjack called on me to speak, I'd say, on a positive note this week, I, I'm becoming more aware of our demon dialogues. I realize that's our real enemy, not each other, our demon dialogues. It feels good to know that your hand and I can unite against those patterns now that we're more cognizant. But it was easier said than done. One weekend, we had dinner with this couple. The gal, Terry, worked with Johanna over at Hyundai. The husband, name of Burton, was from out east. Though you, you wouldn't know it to look at me, I was born with a shy temperament. To relax in the social context, I like to throw back a few margaritas. I was feeling okay when the gal, Terry, put her elbows on the table and leaned toward my wife, gearing up for some girl talk. So how'd you guys meet, Terry said. I was involved with Burton in a conversation about his wheat allergy. <laughs> it was supposed to be a green card marriage, Johanna said. At first, I said, button in. Johanna kept looking at Terry. I was working at the radio station. My visa was running out. I knew Charlie a little. I, I thought he was a really great guy. So yeah, we got married. I got a green card. And you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense, Burton said looking from one of us to the other and nodding like he'd figured out a riddle. What do you mean by that, I asked. Charlie, be nice, Johanna said. I am being nice, I said. Do you think I'm not being nice, Burton? I just meant your different nationalities. Had to be a story behind that. The next week at couples counseling was the first time I started the conversation. My issue is, I said, hey, I've got an issue. Whenever people ask how we met, Johanna says she married me for a green card, like our marriage was just a piece of theater. I do not, Johanna said. You sure as shoot and do. Well, it's true, isn't it? What I'm hearing from Charlie, Dr. Vanderjack said, is that when you do that, even though you might feel that you are stating the facts, what it feels like for Charlie is that you are belittling your bond. What am I supposed to say, Johanna said? Make up a story to say how we met? According to Hold Me Tight, what happened when Johanna told Terry about the green card was that my attachment bond was threatened. I felt like Johanna was pulling away, so that made me want to seek her out by trying to have sex when we got home. Due to the fact that I hadn't been all that nice to Johanna during our night out, due to I was mad about the green card thing, she wasn't exactly in the mood. I'd also had more than my fill of the friendly creature. In other words, it was a surly, drunken, secretly needy, and frightened life mate who made the move across the memory foam. <laughs> the memory foam being a point of contention in itself because Johanna loves that mattress while I'm convinced it's responsible for my lower lumbar pain. <laughs> that was our pattern. Johanna fleeing me bloodhounding her trail. Thank you.